Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this special airing of the Blueprint Leadership Podcast. I'm Kay Wright, your Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, and uh, today we have with us a uh, very special person, a very special chief, and we happen to be recording from the headquarters of 16th Air Force uh, here in Joint Base San Antonio, Lackland. Uh, our guest is someone that I've gotten to, to know over the years, someone that I've actually watched um, uh, grow into her own as a senior leader in our Air Force, someone who is very, very respected by lots of uh, not just chiefs and airmen, but uh, senior leaders, general officers all across our Air Force. Uh, her current role is as the command chief of the 16th Air Force, uh, where she's responsible for most of the Air Force cyber, ISR, electronic warfare, and all, all things uh, in that arena. Uh, she is Chief Master Sergeant Summer Lifer, also known as the Wonder <laughs> Chief. Welcome to the show. I am so happy to be here. It's an honor. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, no problem. I was very, very excited when I was coming down and I, and I realized that we'd have an opportunity uh, to have a discussion. Uh, let's start with Wonder Chief. What's that all about? Where did that come from? How did, how did, it, how did it come about? I mean, we're all fans of Wonder okay. Woman. Do you, but, uh, do you want the, um, the typical version, right? Or do you want the director's cut? I want the typical version. The typical version. So yeah. the typical version. No, no, no. The director's cut. Direct, that's the yeah. long one, right? So yeah. that's the deeper story. Okay, yeah. Um, so the deeper story is when I was um, a young child, uh, things things were a bit rough, right? Uh, I did not have a lot of positive role models in my home. Um, and things at times, uh, because of the environment I was growing up in, I felt powerless. Um, and uh, I was looking for some kind like that help. Right. Okay. And, um, you know, kids, especially you look for those role models and the superheroes. And I happen to be in the golden age of, uh, Linda Carter's Linda Carter. Wonder yeah. Woman. Right. So here was, uh, a strong, powerful woman, um, who not only vanquished like the bad guys, the adversaries, uh, she also acted from a lot of love and compassion. So, um, that was somebody that in some really dark times in my childhood that I looked at as, um, a positive role model and would try to channel my inner, my inner wonder woman. And, uh, yeah. you know, I had the underoos and stuff and <laughs> <laughs> running around the house and trying to lasso the, the pets. Um, and that's something, you know, kind of off and on stayed with me over the years and, as I grew older, I didn't think about it as much. Of course, loved Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. um, and then a few years ago, I was at a duty location as part of one of my going away um, gifts that they gave me. There was a, you know, a Wonder Woman logo on it. Mm -hmm. And so then the whole Wonder Chief started yeah. and I did not discourage it. So starting with that going away present, that is the, the story that I, most people hear, yeah. right? I, I don't usually go into the longer story. Um, so I didn't discourage it when people started giving me mm -hmm. those things. And then the timing worked out. So the movie came out, the newest movie in yeah. like 2017. And um, I have always been a huge fan. Like I said, I think there is somebody, there's the obvious that this is a very powerful, strong woman. Mm -hmm. um, for me, though, even beyond that is here is somebody that um, always comes from a place of love and compassion, yeah. right? And uh, so one of the, the quotes that I have up in my office is, only love can truly save the world. And that is actually wow. from the Wonder Woman movie. So yeah. yes, it's very meaningful to me. No, I, I, I like it. And I, I think, um, you know, people actually see you uh, as this wonder chief, as this wonder woman, as this, this person who, uh, like you talked about her strong, uh, very compassionate, very intelligent, very confident. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's kind of the word on the street about <laughs> summer laughers. So, uh, I mean, that's very humbling. Yeah. That's, that's very humbling. Um, I do hope that I live up to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about your, your, tell me about your leadership journey, your leadership. Uh, do you have a le particular philosophy that you live by in terms of how you go about mm -hmm. leading? Uh, I Aaron? do. So I, a, f a few years ago, uh, I sat down and on the, um, advice of some of my mentors to really try to <clears throat> put down in words what my leadership philosophy is. And, um, what I found is I, I, when I first and I'll share this with you in a moment. When mm -hmm. I first pinned this and put the words on paper, 
as I would share it with people, initially I started off talking about this is my leadership philosophy. Yeah. What I've come to find is it's more than that. It's my leadership philosophy. It's also my followership. It's how I am a wingman. It's, mm -hmm. it's just how I roll, right? This is just who I am and how I, yeah. how I, I like to come into the world, right? And how I interact with people. So my how I roll <clears> philosophy <throat> is uh, <laughs> it's trust, right? Everything yeah. is built on trust um, by the, especially as we serve our nation by the, the fact that we are wearing the cloth of our nation mm -hmm. um, and for our civilians that have um, committed themselves to our nation and our contractors, right? The people that are serving um, fellow Americans and trying to make the world a better place automatically have my trust. They mm -hmm. don't have to earn it. They've got my trust. And I understand that that doesn't come easily for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so for those that I have to earn their trust, I'm okay with that. But my going in is my default is trust. Now, of course, I had to expand on that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm a chief and I've been in for well over 20 years. So, you know, everything's got to be an acronym, right? right? So um, <laughs> as I explain what that really means, uh, the, the first part of it is transparency. So I believe in radical transparency even if it's uncomfortable for me. Mm -hmm. um, as much information as I can give um, to as many people as I can give, I think that's important. Um, I have found that that is really helpful in a lot of ways. So um, by engaging in a transparent way, um, one, uh, I think it people that are adults, right? And even if you're 17 years old and came in the United States Air Force with mom and dad's permission, right? Mm -hmm. You're an adult and adults work best when they understand <clears throat> the the reasons behind things and the vision and the intent. Um, so it's really helpful to give them that. The other thing is I've found by being radically transparent, um, it helps me manage my blind spots and mitigate my blind spots because yeah. in um, saying, hey, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing or why I think the way I think, um, people can offer me other perspectives or feedback that can adjust it. And I tell people I have loosely held strong opinions. So uh, <laughs> I will be very passionate about something. And yeah. if you can give me a different perspective or information I didn't have previously, I will change it. And I can change it like that. Yeah. Um, so being transparent allows me to do that. Yeah. Um, let's, that let's chew on that for yeah. just a second. Why, why do you think more of our peers, uh, I'm sort of like you, mm -hmm. uh, I believe in, uh, and that's, I'm going to coin your phrase, radical transparency. Mm -hmm. But why do you think our peers, you know, those of us that are in the, in the leadership positions, whether it's our fellow command chiefs or um, uh, some of the commanders that we work for, aren't as transparent or don't believe in the level of transparency uh, like like yourself? Um, I don't want to be presumptive about why they don't. What mm -hmm. I will say for me, something I had to overcome to or that I and I still have to manage is it's very vulnerable, right? Mm. It, it is you when I especially like I said, to engage in radical transparency, even when it's uncomfortable, does make me vulnerable. Yeah. Um, the cool thing is I've learned it's okay, right? Yeah. So by being vulnerable, um, there's I've never been hurt by yeah. that, right? Like nothing. So maybe I look silly, whatever, right? You go, you get over it. Um, maybe it comes to light that I made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes, the right? Airmen love it, right? And so, and it gives me that opportunity. So I just think it makes more real. So the the more comfortable I've become with vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? And it's being publicly acknowledging mistakes or missteps and, and growing and learning from that um, in a way that makes you invulnerable, yeah. right? When you are not worried about being vulnerable, that actually makes you invulnerable, yeah. if that makes sense. Were you always that way or did something happen? Did you kind of grow into this, this vulnerable, being vulnerable? And um, I, I've, I would say I've grown into it. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, I love talking to airmen because airmen, there's so many of our younger airmen coming in now. And I'm, I mean, civilians, officers enlisted yeah. there. They have so much more wisdom than I had coming in. Um, oh, I have so many stories. Okay. So let me tell you the story. So <laughs> all right, all right. I, here's a good example of being vulnerable. So when I was uh, a real pivotal point for me in my career, um, I had, I was a, Master Sergeant Select, mm -hmm. and I had been selected, that's another whole long story, to serve as um, additional duty first sergeant for a unit that typically was a senior master sergeant, first sergeant position. Mm -hmm. At the time, there was like 600 people in it, had 11 OLs, the dead, it was huge. Um, and that's another leadership story about how I got selected 
to even do that. Mm -hmm. um, but the guy that was leaving, he had been selected to go be a chief, and so it was going to be a gap for the next senior master sergeant came in. And so I had the great honor of shadowing this chief mm -hmm. first sergeant, so Master Jedi. You know mm -hmm. what that is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So Master Jedi. Um, <laughs> And maintainer background, like just amazing, incredible leader. Yeah. Um, and I had spent a lot of time uh, working with him up until that point. So once it was official, I was going to be the, the gap fill between the two first sergeants. Uh, I started shadowing him for a couple months. And what I noticed was he started doing these things, like not inappropriate, but things that embarrassed me, right? Mm -hmm. Publicly in front of a lot of people, like taking me down notches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at first I thought it was just in my head, but then other people started commenting and like, man, what'd you do to make the chief mad? Right? I'm like, I don't know. So <laughs> finally, after a couple of weeks, I went to him and I said, Hey, if you are second guessing this decision, I totally understand. I haven't even put on master sergeant yet. There's a lot of wonderful people that could be doing this. I understand if you want he's, he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, you, you seem to have some reservations. You know, you're, you're really kind of throwing me under the bus, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he started laughing. He's like, I was wondering when you were going to say something. He said, look, everybody thinks you're an ice queen. I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. He's like, that's how you come off, right? That you are perfect and that you never make any mistakes and that you've always got it together. Um, and let me tell you, that is not the case. That has never been the case. Mm -hmm. um, he's like, they don't know the you. They're not, you're not really sharing the authentic you. And if you're going to even gap fill as a first sergeant, people have to feel that you're approachable and that they can come to you. Oh, wow. Um, and so reflecting on it, he could have just told me that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I don't know, know if he right? had to go through the whole thing. Um, but it was effective. And yeah. so I would like to say the light bulb came on in that mm -hmm. second and I fixed it. It didn't. It took some time because, again, vulnerability. Yeah. So I think what had happened is I in my head um, had like created this image of what I thought a professional airman, um, particularly as a woman, mm -hmm. right, that I had to present myself to be taken seriously. Right. And I was very um, hesitant. I didn't want to present the other parts of me and, mm -hmm. and, um, I'm, I'm goofy and I like puns and silly jokes and I'm very warm and I was afraid to bring that. And, yeah. it, and I'm really so grateful when I look back on that because by him, like kind of opening that door, right. For me to start that journey, um, one, it, it allowed me to start becoming much more authentic mm -hmm. as an airman. And what I found is people Yes, where I had been good before, I became so much better, yeah. right? The other thing I'm really grateful for is um, it allowed me to relax in my personal life as well because mm -hmm. I, f I think during that first half of my career, I spent a lot of time trying to live two different lives, mm -hmm. right? So I would try to be one person as an airman and then go home and as summer, right? And as yeah. a mom and as a wife, be somebody totally different. And it, it was very jarring and I found that Less and less was I wasn't bringing my real self into work, but more and more I was taking that work persona that I created home. And that was causing a lot of stress. Um, and I just was very unhappy, right? Yeah. And so all kinds of different ways that that showed up in my life as far as the stress on my relationships, a lot of physical things like, um, you know, because your body, like if, if you don't pay attention, your body will start screaming at you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so since I have been on that journey and it continues to this day of just being fully myself in whatever I'm doing to include being completely vulnerable, like right now. Yeah. Right? You know, this is yeah. so fascinating because you know how many young airmen, young professionals who will be listening to this will be saying, Hey man, I feel the same way. Uh, and if she can be vulnerable, if she can be transparent and open and, and fuse the two selves, mm -hmm. you know, the home, the spouse, the, the, the mom, the dad or whoever, and the professional person, man, maybe, maybe I can do it. You know, I, and one of the things I would offer to airmen that this may be their experience as well is look at our air force core values. I love our core values mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about just the quick 
bumper sticker, you know, the quick integrity for service before self excellence and all we do. Mm -hmm. I'm talking if you really reflect on the deep meaning and you read all of the the documents um, and thought that mm -hmm. went into it going, you know, decades back, beautiful language. By the way, the, the older documents had words like love and compassion and oh, mercy, yeah. right? Beautiful yeah. language. One of the things in integrity first, when you think about it, um, we often talk about it's doing the right thing when no one's looking, it's doing the right thing when everyone's looking. That's actually harder. Right. Um, but if you look at the word integrity, it's a state of wholeness, mm -hmm. a state of being unbroken. Mm -hmm. So as an airman, it also, we need everybody to bring their whole complete selves, right? There is something special and unique about every individual that yeah. only they can do. Yes, duty-wise, we will always find someone to do that duty. Mm -hmm. But as far as that, that, that special thing that mm -hmm. that airman brings, there is no one in this entire world that is exactly like them and is going to yeah. be able to bring that special thing, yeah. right? And so we have to have that whole complete self. So that's how all that journey started. The more and more... And every day it's validated that I, I show up whole and complete. It, I find that it resonates with the people that I'm trying to connect with. Connection is mm -hmm. very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that I feel um, more at peace with what yeah. I'm doing. Wow. Right. So that was a very powerful yeah. um, point in my life. So that is why, for me, transparency, transparency. is... Okay. is radical, a, transparency. radical transparency. Radical okay. transparency. I mean... You lean fully into it, right? Mm -hmm. And not, don't, why, don't be scared, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, now, that also takes us and, and people that are in leadership positions and kind of guardian positions mm -hmm. to, to make sure that people have the safety to right. do that, right? Um, but it's, would you agree that it's easier said than done? Absolutely. Yeah. The best things in life are easier said <laughs> than done, right? The most important things. Yeah. Um, but it is it's liberating, it's I think. It, it yeah. is. That is a beautiful word for it, yeah, right? It is completely. And that's what I was saying, that in the willingness to be completely vulnerable, mm -hmm. right, there comes an invulnerability, right? Because the essence of who you are will not be harmed, mm -hmm. right? So what? You, you get embarrassed or it looks clumsy or whatever. Yeah. That The essence of who you are will not be damaged by yeah. that. Now, has um, have you spent much time talking to, I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, you were a mentor for, you know, lots of people. And, and you mentioned earlier that you have mentors. Have you spent much time actually um, um, talking about maybe even debating whether this is, the right thing to do. And let's, let's talk specifically. Okay. Sometimes we try to get away from this conversation, but I, I like for you and I to lean into it specifically okay. our female, uh, up and coming, you know, leaders, airmen and so on and so forth. Um, what, what do they think about, well, yeah, but you're summer life or you're wonder chief. It's okay for you to do it, but I'm, I'm just trying to establish, you know, maybe, maybe who I am. And I, I don't know if I feel as comfortable or I don't know that I've, I have the safety, the environment mm -hmm. where I feel safe enough to be radically transparent and vulnerable. Okay, there's a few things to unpack there. Yeah. One thing, um, and I and I always respond with love when I'm saying this. This is coming from a loving place because when it's when oh, it's phrased, gonna be good. Gonna be right? Good. When it's phrased, I know the intent is good. Um, let me be really clear with you and everyone else. I am not a female chief. I'm not a female command chief. I'm not a female airman. I am a chief, I am a command chief, and yep. I'm an airman. I happen to be a woman. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of different things and descriptors. So yeah. one of the things I would first ask everyone to do is pay attention to the words and the language that you use um, because I think it gives insight into our thoughts, right? Okay. Um, so when you put female chief, for mm -hmm. example, in front of something, you put a modifier in the front of the word chief. Have you ever, or do you regularly hear any other modifier put in front of the word chief? Um, no, other right. than good or great or bad or right. sloppy, um, sorry. For some reason, my experience has been, um, and I, I don't, I can only speak from my experience. Mm -hmm. My experience has been gender, particularly female women, mm -hmm. are the only ones that get modifiers put in front of their their title, their position, their rank. Um, I understand where that's coming from on yeah. one hand. On the other hand, what you're saying is the a chief is male, um, 
I'm just gonna stop there, right? Typically right, male, right? right, right? Yeah. And then and then you're different, right? You're you're setting that person apart. So I would ask everyone to just pay attention to their language and what they're doing. Um, and, and men and women do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because we don't use other descriptive modifiers in front of chief. Only female. It's the yeah. only one I ever hear. Wow. So that's one. I'm going to start there. Now, as far as being a woman, I, I think that's part of it. Like, do you identify yourself as this is what I would say to, to women that are serving, do you identify yourself as a female fill in the blank? Mm -hmm. Or do you identify first with that, that rank or that duty title or the position? Like, how do you identify yourself? Mm -hmm. um, because that, that really kind of sets the parameters. Like the most important thing isn't the outside world, right? The, right. the most important thing is self-awareness and understanding what limitations you have first put on yourself, right? That's why I'm spending a lot of time talking about the modifiers, yeah, right? Yeah, no, no, so when I made a decision, <clears throat> uh, you know, earlier in my career is like, I'm not a female master sergeant. I'm not mm -hmm. a female, right? I'm a master sergeant. Um, and to lean fully into that while respecting all of those other different things that are part of my identity. And I think that we unfairly, and it's not just women. I mean, men too. I've, I felt this whole equality when you talk about genders. And then by the way, I, I want to give a shout out to a lot of our airmen that are non-binary or identify non-binary right. yeah. or, I mean, there's a whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these things that we do, they're heuristics that allow us to kind of quickly get to what we think people are, um, but they're limiting, mm -hmm. right? So, Look at the ways in our in your life is what I would challenge them. Are you limiting yourself in some way, mm -hmm. right? Be proud of your identity and the different ways that you identify yourself. And also reflect on um, those things. Do they limit you or do they help expand you, right? right. Expand into who you are. Mm -hmm. um, don't limit it. Um, one of the things that it's, oh man, there, there's so much with that. Right. And it's yeah. interesting because there are two frequently asked questions that I get, um, as I, if I do all calls or like lunches with airmen or stuff, uh, the first is what is your experience as a female chief, female airman? Um, the second one, you want to guess what the, the second one is related to? Mm -mm. I don't want to guess. I want you to tell me. Sergeant Kibby knows what's the second one related to the, well, in the, we're going to get into it in the segment, but we can go ahead and jump into that one right now. No, I'll come back to it. I just want you to say it out loud. What is this? Your second? hair. My hair. Really? Oh, yeah. So I want to come back to that. Okay. Because, right? yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> um, and I, I have a, a whole thing about that as well. Yeah. But that's one of those things um, I'm trying to help um, all airmen, however, whatever gender they identify with, um, to expand how they look at people, mm -hmm. right? Rather than limiting them to something as, and I, I'm going to say superficial because it really is a superficial thing, like what their what their gender identity is, um, the color of their skin, what their their accent, mm -hmm. right? Um, whatever preferences they have in their life, like we are so much more as human beings. Right. So. Um, for the women that feel like, okay, yeah, that's easy for you to say. Um, it hasn't been. And you know, what's interesting is, um, I have had more challenges presented to me, um, as an airman that happens to be a woman in this position than the rest of my career. This position you're yes. currently in. Yes. How so? Um, I've been reflecting on that because I was, I went through, through a bit of shock when I first started con confronting that, like when that first, cause just a couple of years ago as a wing command chief, I remember being part of a women's leadership panel. Mm -hmm. Um, and someone said, you know, tell me about the times you've dealt with, uh, discrimination, um, in your career as a woman. I was like, ah, it's really not been, been horrible. I know some people have, right. Mm -hmm. Just my experience. And, and part of it is because, uh, the, the career fields that I've grown up in, there are, uh, percentage wise, more women, um, than some of the other career fields. Mm -hmm. Um, it hasn't been too bad a couple times. And by the way, it's been from men and women, mm -hmm. right? Women have their own biases. Um, 
it hasn't been too bad, right? And then I got to the NAF level, and then I got punched in the face with it, uh, figuratively. Right. Um, one of my peers, uh, on one of our first conversations, we were sitting, this is what I'm talking about, radical transparency, right? Because it's about to get uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, we met in my office, and uh, first conversation we've ever had, and I said, uh, you know, please have a seat. And he said, hey, you know what your greatest weakness is? I'm like, hey, it's good to talk, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. What is it? Tell me what my greatest weakness is. And he's like, you're too pretty. I said, Whoa, what? <laughs> wow. I was like, please tell me more about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm intrigued why you would say that. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, yeah, we have been talking about that. Um, and uh, it's a good thing that General O'Brien, this is radical transparency, mm -hmm. that General O'Brien hired you because, you know, she's another um, pretty woman. This is what they were saying about a two, now three-star general. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, typically pretty women are, um, challenged by other pretty women, but she's also very smart. And so you're smart. So I think that was good that you were hired by her and not a man. Um, that, that actually was a gut punch to me. Yeah. Right. That, that took. Like I couldn't even breathe for a second yeah. because I have dealt my whole career with, with kind of small mindedness. Um, but to have someone tell me and the way that they presented it was as if, you know, th that, that a group they, of my yeah. peers had been talking about it. Um, I felt was, um, disappointing, right? Yeah. More than, ins it doesn't insult me because I know who I am. Right. It disappointed me. So let me just interrupt you for a second though. Yeah. Um, one, when when collectively we as an Air Force decided that this you this was the right job for you, we 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 didn't, I, I would have never anticipated that something like, like that would happen. But I think deep down we all knew that if something like that happened in those tough situations that you could handle it. Right? Oh, I did. And I, and, I, and I know you did. And going back to your, your comment earlier about, which I really, really value and respect about, hey, I'm not a female chief and we should not put these, these monikers. But the fact remains that th that happens to women all over yes. our our, and I'll yes. talk specific, specifically about our Air Force. That happens to women all over our Air Force who may not um, have the skill set and the confidence that you have to be able to man. I'm interested in, in how you either choked them out or, you know, figuratively mm -hmm. choked them out and, <laughs> and got the conversation back on track. Uh -huh. But um, and so I, I think it's again, it's so powerful that. People across our Air Force get to hear, you know, your radical mm -hmm. transparency about the type of shit, really, to be honest, yeah. that that um, because I guarantee you that is never and I'm, I'm going on camera <laughs> on on tape right now to say it has never happened with a man. No one has ever nope. walked in and said, you know what, Kay, right? You're just too ugly or you know, <laughs> Harry, you're too handsome or yeah. what have you, right? So so that that is a, a a a thing that I think many of our females deal with. So so how'd you handle it? Um so it's interesting. I um I don't shy away from confrontation at all. Mm -hmm. and, and not uh confrontation as in like I'm not looking for a fight, mm -hmm. right? Harry got another story for you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to my response, yeah, but yeah, here's yeah. a fun story. So when I was at Airman Leadership School, and, uh, you know, they got you in the U-shaped desk, uh -huh. right? And they were doing an icebreaker, and they had us go around the room, and it's like, tell us what animal you would be and why, mm -hmm. right? And I was about two-thirds of the way around. And so they're going around the table, and people are like, I'd be a wolf because I'm a lunar. <laughs> and I would be a dolphin because I love the ocean, right? Like all these cute things. And so they got to me, and I'm like... I'd be the bull and not cause I'm just full of it. That is mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was like, I just, I just want to sit in the field, right. In the sunshine with the people around, like with the other the herd around me, right. That we love enjoying the, the soft green grass and the breeze. Um, but if you come into my field and you try to mess with me or my own, I'm going to get up. I'm going to trample you. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm going to go back to my sunny spot in the field and enjoy the sunshine. Right. I'm wow. not looking for the fight. Mm-hmm but I will 
I will end you if you need it. There you go. I like it. Um, so the, the conversation I had with this individual later, uh, I talked about character and competence. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, there are two big things that I'm looking for when I am deciding, uh, the kind of working relationship I'm going to have with individuals. Um, competence is important. We absolutely need a certain level of confidence, uh, uh, competence to, to do the jobs and do what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, competence can be trained, right? You can teach someone a skill how to do things. Some of them it's easier than others mm -hmm. depending on their aptitudes and their willingness to do it. But competence is a trainable thing. Character is harder, right? Character is something that is deep. And you can work on it and you can develop, but that is a much deeper thing and that's really in, an intrinsic personally driven thing. Right. Um, I can give a little bit on the competence when I'm working with someone. I can be patient with a lower competence level. I will not tolerate lapses in character. Mm -hmm. And that conversation and those comments that were made to me indicated a serious deficit in character. Wow. Right. So you either get in line, right? And that's what I said, like, look me in the eye and tell me that you understand what is acceptable and not acceptable, or we will find you another place, right? I was assured that they understand and we're in line. We shall see. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's heroic. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. So radical transparency. Yes. Um, what else? Um, Another part, so one more reason why transparency mm -hmm. is so important, and it kind of goes to what we're talking about right now. Uh, I don't know what your experience has been. Mine has been at times I'm put into positions or situations that I've never been in before, and I don't mm -hmm. know what to do, right? And that's part of why we tell so many stories, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I go back to, okay, what, what have others shared with me? What can I fall back on? So when I am very transparent and I give, Hey, this is why I did what I did, what I was thinking at the time to include, if I had it to do over, I would do it differently. Mm -hmm. Um, it gives people data points, right? Oh. It gives them information. So should they find themselves in that kind of situation down the road, right? They have something to fall back on. They may do it completely different, mm -hmm. but they have something. Yeah. Right. So that's part of the transparency. All of those things that I do, um, you know, trying to mitigate my blind spots, um, give them as much information as possible. Um, that is all part of how I show respect, which is my second point. I believe that the quickest way to get respect is to give respect. Um, and again, just like with trust, I'll go first. Right. Mm -hmm. I am I am happy to be the, the first to extend. And this is beyond the um, professional customs and courtesies that we, of course, are obligated to uphold. Um, this is personal respect. So whether, whether you're an E1 that has been in with us one week mm -hmm. or somebody has done 30 years plus of service, um, we are in this together and there's a certain amount of respect that we owe each other. Um, I find, too, that that helps move um, teams and organizations from a place of compliance to commitment, yeah. right? And the things that we ask um, airmen um, and their families to do, they are not truly compensated in kind mm -hmm. monetarily, right? So this is a something we're asking people to give their heart and souls to. We, we want to be in a place of commitment. So that's part of the, the, the showing that mutual respect. I think one of the best ways to show respect is my next point, which is understanding. To, so it's very important for me personally to seek to understand before being understood. Mm -hmm. um, I try very hard because um, I do, like, uh, you ever see that, uh, I can't remember which Avengers movie it was when they ask uh, Bruce Banner, like, how, why he's so chill all the time, right? Before he to the Hulk and he's like, I'm angry all the time, yeah. right? <laughs> um, I, I can have a quick to spark reaction on things. Mm -hmm. And so I work, um, I work to maintain some space between that stimulus and response, right? So that I can choose how I respond. And so I will, even in uh, things that I have initial quick reaction to mm -hmm. try to take time to help me understand where you're coming from, mm -hmm. right? Like, what is it that you're thinking? Um, and in doing that, people often are much more open to then listening on the other side, right? Yeah. I think in order to get to understanding mm -hmm. and, um, which is a, a huge part of, of trust, you've got to be a good listener. Mm-hmm. 
and I, I, I don't know that um, from a leadership perspective that we that we always um, spend uh, a lot of time listening. I mean, like truly listening. Oh, yeah. You know, like General Goldfein and I say, squinting with your your ears, because you know when you get all this training and, and you've been to. I mean, you're very very well educated. I mean, you've taken advantage of. Um, learning opportunities that mm -hmm. the Air Force has provided you, and I know you've leaned way, way forward and taken advantage of lots of other uh, learning opportunities. So you have all this knowledge and you have all of this data, and you know sometimes as leaders we think, hey, I got to get this stuff out. I got to, you know, I know a lot of things, and I got to mm -hmm. tell people. Um, so I think it's it's very admirable that uh, someone like yourself spends a lot of time and 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 is so invested in listening to try to understand um, other people. Well. You know, by, I already know what I know, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I don't know, and I'm not <laughs> going to know that unless I listen and open my mind, yeah. right? Oh. So um, the other thing I think is beautiful about it is, so everybody has a story, right? Mm -hmm. And way deeper than just the kind of curated thing that they present on social media, right? right? They have these beautiful, deep stories. Mm -hmm. And in sharing those stories... That's what really connects us. Mm -hmm. Sharing and listening and honoring those stories and giving them the space that they deserve. Um, I am every day, like one of the, the greatest honors and privileges I have that comes with this position is the access I have um, to just talking to airmen, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, could, I challenge right now, you could go down the hallway, the first airman you meet, and you, you start asking them questions, right? And give them the space to really tell their story. Yeah. You're going to be blown away, right? Yeah. You will be inspired. It's just because they're incredible human beings. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever done the, I think it's like the Clifton Strength Finders? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you remember what your top five were? My top five were um, learner. Achiever, individual, individualist, uh, which means that I see mm -hmm. it, when you hear it, you think like it, it's about yourself, but it really means yes. that you see every single person as mm -hmm. an individual. You don't put people into groups. Learner, mm -hmm. achiever, individualist. Uh, I, I know I put I, you I, on the spot. Yeah. So learner it's interesting because my um, top five learner individualization, right? Mm -hmm. So seeing right. everybody for the unique, beautiful person that they are. Mm -hmm. um, ideation, right? So putting um, what would typically be disparate ideas or very different kind of ideas, connecting them in mm -hmm. um, novel ways. Um, connector and arranger. Connector and arranger. Those are my other two. What? Look yeah. at this. Yeah. Um, so that's by listening, right? And seeking to understand, that's how I pull all those different things together. Um, and uh, it has helped me not only kind of make sure that I have the right information that I need to best advise and take care of airmen and their families. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it has also helped me build those different connections between other people and teams. Yeah. How many airmen are you responsible for? 44,000. 44,000. Um, part of the challenge and what uh, most leaders would tell you is like, man, I just don't have the time. Right. I'm, I got 44,000 airmen to take take care of. I don't have time to listen to the stories. I'm walking through the hallways. I'm trying to get to a meeting. You know, uh, my boss needs me here. I got to go over here. You know, how do you find the time to have these long conversations or mm -hmm. listen to airmen and get drawn into these stories about their life and what's happening with them? Um, yeah, I call that the white rabbit, right? So, <laughs> you know, like in Alice in Wonderland, the white yeah. rabbit that's running around. It's no time, it's no time running late. Like, yeah. um, to be serious for a second, yeah. like, how much time have we spent recently talking about resiliency, mm -hmm. right? We have a, a serious, terrible, heartbreaking problem right now mm -hmm. with airmen. Over and over, it comes back to airmen are lonely mm -hmm. and they do not feel connected. Mm -hmm. Yet, we still say we don't have time. Mm -hmm. you, you can tell me, right? You can, you can say out loud or you can write down what your priorities are. I'm going to watch how you spend your time. Mm -hmm. Your time tells me what your priorities are. Yeah. Right. So if we say airmen are important to us, taking care of airmen and their families are important to us, you will give it that, that time. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be, by the way, I'm not going to get to talk to 44,000 right. airmen, right? right. Um, I do get to talk to the airmen that are around me in my immediate circle every single day. Mm -hmm. And 
you don't have to get into, sometimes I have these beautiful conversations that go on for, you know, an hour or more, but sometimes I have some of the most meaningful conversations and moments I've had are five minutes in the hallway, yeah. right? So here's an easy exercise as you're walking um, to take a comfort break and you're about to pass someone um, instead of as you pass them shoulder to shoulder, say, Hey, how are you doing? And they keep walking, yeah. slow down a little bit, look them in the eye. Hey, how are you doing? Wait for the answer. And even if they say it's great, I'm great, which yeah. they won't typically right. like ask them, Hey, what's going on? It's great. It's yeah. five minutes. And it could really mean in the I mean, world to you and that other person. The, the crux of it is we all make time for what's important to us. Exactly. Right? And if our airman's health and our airman's resilience and our airman's well-being is important to us, you make time. When people tell me they don't have time, man, I always challenge them. Yes. You know, go read for our work week. Go out, go read the power of less. Go read essentialism. Mm -hmm. Show me, do it. Let's do a time, you know, kind of like we yes. used to do back in school and show me what you're doing with your time every day. Oh man, right. you got four hours on Facebook. You got two or three hours at the water cooler or in the break room. You got like, you got a lot of time that you could actually be doing, you know, you, you spending, yep. and then this is real world. Yes. You spending, you know, an hour and a half or two hours a day marking up EPRs with red ink and, and all mm -hmm. this other stuff. It's like, no, man, you're, most of us as leaders, we have plenty of time. It's just, you know, what have we deemed important? Yes. And how do we spend our, our time between the, the real, I would say, tangible leadership mm -hmm. things and the management tasks that we all kind of so there, dive into? Yeah. I think there's two opportunities we have um, if we're in a leadership position and then also as, as individuals. If you're in a leadership position, take some time <laughs> to reflect on what you are really rewarding um, and penalizing within your own organization, mm. right? Um, for example, when I do superintendent meetings here, which is one of my favorite meetings that I go to, right? It's having um, our chiefs and our superintendents come in and for me to be able to sync with them. Um, one of the, the bad habits I, I needed to break when I first started doing that is, you know, one of the senior master sergeants or master sergeants would come in a few minutes late and be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late. And they would start going this long, like, explanation of why they were late. And I said, you're a senior non-commissioned officer. You were exactly wherever you needed to be, mm -hmm. right? I didn't ask you. I trust you that you were doing exactly what you needed to do, yeah. right? Um, and that was one of the things that we started talking about. Like, if you need to stop and take care of that airman, right? Or if you need to um, make sure that someone has what they need to go be able to take care of their family, then go do that, right? Rather than being stressed out that I'm gonna be mad that you're not at my meeting, right? right. I'm gonna be mad if you, I find out you came to this meeting and you didn't take that opportunity to make that connection and take care of someone, yeah. right? So as leaders, we need to think about that because again, words and actions aren't always matching. Right. Um, and then as individuals have the courage to do what you know is right. 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 Have the courage. So, um, if you see that words and actions aren't matching with your leadership, if you see that you are being pulled in too many different directions and you feel like you're not able to do the most important thing, have the courage to go have that conversation. Wow. Steve. So understanding. Um, I said two more to get through. <laughs> two more to get through. Right. Um, all of and then that. we're going to take some questions from the audience okay. after you get through. Sure. Your all of that um, is in service to others, right? So I fully, with my whole heart, am committed to servant leadership. Mm -hmm. um, leadership is a privilege. It is not a right. You were not born with the right to mm -hmm. lead people. It is a privilege that... Um, and it's an obligation should you be entrusted with the care of folks. Um, so I think for me, being of service to other people means that um, I am propping them up, right? You turn that pyramid upside down. Um, I am, I personally will feel the most successful as a leader if my name is not even attached to the outcome. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, Chief Lifer did it as we did it, right. right? So that is very important to me. So I talked about all of these things that are kind of, you know, they're, they're warm and fuzzy and uh, tra uh, transparency and respect and understanding and service. My last point is tough love, mm. right? We have to love each other enough yeah. to be able to have those tough conversations. And that goes up and down and all around the chain, right? Wow. So that isn't just me correcting an airman. That is an airman having the courage to speak truth to power mm -hmm. and me having the courage to listen, right? Um, 
that we hold each other accountable. Each one of us is so important, right? And what yeah. we do is so important that we all have to bring our best performance. Yeah. I was talking to a coach last night. I was out at dinner last night with mm. uh, a guy by the name of uh, Tim Dickens, and uh, mm. he's an executive coach. And, and we, we got on this subject about feedback, and, and he recommended a book. Uh, I think it's called... Uh, why nice teams finish last or why oh, nice okay. teams fail. And it was about the lack of tough love, the lack of, you know, tough feedback mm -hmm. and holding each other accountable. So I'm, I'm going to check it yeah, out. Yeah, I do want to emphasize the word love in that, right? Yeah. Which, by the way, is one of my favorite words. Um, and I, my personal values um, that that complement my Air Force core values, my personal values, values are love, balance, and trust. Mm -hmm. Um and I think a lot of times people are like, ooh, love, right? Like that's some kind of soft, delicate word. Yeah. That is a powerful, yes. that is a word that, that belongs to warriors, right? Mm -hmm. We don't die for our country, right? The, it, 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 without it coming from a place of love, right? Right. Yeah. right? We, what we do, we do out of love. Mm -hmm. and, and that is not a weak word. Right. And so tough love, like that is a balance. That is a, from a place of respect and um true commitment to each other that we're able to have those crucial conversations that that was the key to my success was having a mentor who gave me a lot of tough love and mm -hmm. something that i subsequently um it became part of my leadership style and and philosophy mm -hmm. and and we talk all the time i think i was at afa maybe when we were on the stage and talking about hey airmen you know, they don't mind you being tough on them mm -hmm. as long as they know it comes from a place of love yes right so they you know airmen don't typically want to be babied you know, they don't they don't want you to um, they, they want to hear it straight, but they also want to know that in the end uh, you're doing and they don't always like it. Right? right. I didn't always like it. Right. But when my mentor, Joe Wimbush, was was giving me tough love, you know, deep down, I'm like, I know it's because he loves me. I know it's because he wants to see me be successful. And so I appreciated it. I accepted it. And I mean, it it, it changed my life. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. So. Trust, which is transparency, respect, Res understanding, service, and tough love. Yes. All right. I'm going to use that. That's how I roll. I, I like <laughs> it. I love it. And I'm sure our audience will appreciate it. Hey, let's go to uh, the head detective, Harry Kibbe, and uh, take some questions from the audience. Thank you, Chief. Um, Chief, these questions come from Reddit and Twitter. You have a big uh, community out there on Reddit. So I believe two of the three come from there. The first one's kind of a tough one, but I know you don't shy away from tough questions. Um, Danger Face would like to know, do you see a time when we can start doing more with more rather than more with less? We are really in a period now where we're able to do more with more because believe it or not, in the last two or three years, I mean, we've been the Congress and the president has been uh, pretty generous to the United States Air Force, United States military with with the budget. When when I hear people say, and I and I know there is potentially a disconnect between how we see things at the Pentagon or at the numbered Air Force, um, head, higher headquarters level, and what people actually see on the ground, but we General Goldfein has, for the last three years, asked commanders, you don't have to do more with less. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't have to do if stop doing the things that you don't find to be essential to your mission. Um, commanders have been um, given the authority and the responsibility to cut out the things that they don't see as essential. And so not a lot of people. I, I understand that there will be pockets, uh, but that should no longer be the philosophy across the Air Force that we are doing more with less. What, what he's asked people to do is, hey, do less with less. Do you see that trickling down, that General Goldfein's uh, strategy or ideas for helping that? It is, and we can do more, right? Yeah. So here's where I think we need to do more, and I know Lieutenant General Hawk is committed to as well, is um, when commanders are making those calls, right, on what things that we're going to cut out or where we're going to um, consolidate our resources to focus on the most important things, is that we need to tell that story. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to get that story out there more um, and get that recognized. Radical transparency is what we need. Yes. Right. To include. And I think this is going to be a really important part of the story to include when it doesn't work. 
That's the most important thing, because we talked earlier about how um, how tough it is to be vulnerable, right? So um, we're asking leaders to to take risk and to potentially be vulnerable, right? They have an idea of like, these are the things that have been rewarded in the past. I know that if I stay within this safety zone, we may not grow, things might not be great, but this is a safe place, right? But that doesn't mean it's the optimal place where we should be. So what we're looking for are stories not only where leaders and commanders have have taken risk and it worked, where they've taken risk and maybe it wasn't ideal and that's okay too, right? We have to I think part of our, our cultural um, evolution is to get people okay, comfortable with uh, discovery learning, figuring out what doesn't work, um, and to, to be okay with, hey, all right, now we you know, know that's not the ideal thing, let's try something else, and for them to not be punished, right? And it, short, short of we don't want any kind of catastrophe, light, loss of life, um, huge financial losses, but more often than not, that's not what is at risk, right? We're talking about, um, hey, that that system or that process wasn't, they didn't work out the way we thought. Okay, pivot, right? Let's do something different. Yeah. Um, and then actually telling that story more because right now people hear the words that, that that's what we want, right? That's what our leadership wants. But everybody's, my take on it is people are waiting to see who goes first yeah. and how does that work out for them? Yeah. yeah. Right. I think we have to be more like, you know, Elon Musk when we were at, you know, mm. he talked about uh, trying but failing should actually be rewarded. Yes. You should punish people who aren't even trying. And he, now he was talking specifically about innovation, right. but I think the same concept applies. Yeah. And then um, to, I think one of the things too, I, I, we're focusing on in the 16th Air Force, um, I'm going to get all nerdy with semantics for a second. When you say do more with more, we want to do more of what matters most, mm. right? The most impactful things, um, and then put the resources to that, right? So when I hear more with more, that's one of the first things that comes to mind yeah. for me. Wow. Focus. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Chief. Again, that one was for Danger Face. Um, 12 Ed Dawn um, would like to know, how do you tell people to do stuff without becoming their enemy? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, okay, let me unpack that a little bit. So one, I, I don't, I try rarely not to tell people to do things, right? I give um, vision and intent, right? This is what I would hope that we accomplish as a team. This is why I'm hoping that we do it. This is why it's important, the why behind it. Um, and then I let them tell me how we should do it, right? Um, and that, that's an interesting journey I think a lot of senior leaders have to go through, right? To, to go from the, the executor of things, right? The actual doer of things to leading people that are doing the things um, because that is a humility check. For a long time, I, I thought, you know, there's a, and still now there are times where I'm like, I know how to do that, right? And I could tell them exactly how to do it and it would be so much easier. Um, that is hubris, right? That is just pride because more often than not, yeah, my way would work okay, but they're going to come up with things I never thought of, right? And it's going to be so much better. And then even the times where they don't, right? Like that's part of their learning. So, right, being willing to let them learn that on their own, that is part of the journey and being there to support them along the way and kind of give them some, uh, I don't know, left and right bolsters, right? It is, quite frankly, it has never crossed my mind that in working with a team that it would be at risk of them becoming adversarial. That is very interesting to me. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about um, in the teams that I'm on and I'm part of is uh, I need everybody to like that's wearing a uniform to check your name tape. So unless somebody has snuck in, you know, it's got one of our adversarial like you know, in front, like it's U.S. Air Force, like we are all on the same team. And so we can have disagreements, right? Confrontation is okay, mm -hmm. right? To have, in fact, that is healthy. I get really worried, and that's why I'm interested in this book. I get very worried when I go into some kind of, you know, workshop or working group or something, and everybody's like, everything's great, and it's wonderful, whatever you say, right? Like, that's not healthy for us. Mm -hmm. um, I want us to have healthy conflict. That's what I'm looking for. Conflict is okay, right? It's how we channel it 
in how we leverage it as in how we preserve the relationship. It's all about building relationships. Mm. And you know, it's interesting. You go to retirement ceremonies. Do people talk about, man, I crushed so many tasks, right? right? No. Mm. <laughs> they don't. They talk about the relationships and the teams and the, the people they worked with. So um, on one point, I want to talk because words, right? I love words. So linguist by trade, I geek out about words. Um, the, I want to talk about the word ownership because I think this sometimes gets people in, into um, unnecessary adversarial kind of stances against each other. Uh, so I just offer this as a perspective. Um, I no offense to to you or anyone mm -hmm. else that um, uses phrases like "you got to take ownership of that." Mm -hmm. I want you to own it. I know what the intent is behind it. We want people to to commit themselves to something, to be passionate about what they're doing. Right? That's that's really what I get as the intent behind it. Unfortunately, kind of the shadow side of that is their ego gets wrapped up in it. Right? Mm -hmm. So because they start making that part of their identity. This, this thing is my thing, right? And so when people start getting their ego wrapped around things, because mm -hmm. they've owned it, um, it is sometimes puts them at risk of not being able to take constructive criticism or feedback or change, right? Um, we could um, have a commitment to do something as airmen for decades and then you know, come in one day and they say, we no longer need this, right? We need something else. Um, the, the response we would hope would come back is Roger that, right? Whatever our country needs, mm. <laughs> that is, uh, not been my experience, yeah. right? Um, so I tell people don't take an ego trip on your ownership, right? Like, <laughs> uh, and I had to phrase it that way because when I first started having this conversation with airmen, um, Airmen are very attached to that word ownership yeah. in owning yeah. things and they like it. I'm like, okay, cool, man. I don't care what word you use. Mm. I'm just telling you, please understand that truly we are stewards of things that have been entrusted to us by the United States. Um, and that at any point that could change. Right. right. And so I want you to have the absolute commitment and passion for it and understand it doesn't actually belong to you. And that's hard, right? That yeah. That's another kind of humility check, to mm -hmm. be able to have the same level of commitment and passion to something and know that it isn't really yours. Right. You are trusted with it. Uh, that's That takes a level of maturity. So by approaching things like that, it helps diffuse a lot of the things I think otherwise would be adversarial. Gotcha. Well, yeah. Okay, Chief. Um, two great responses and our last submitter um or the last one that we chose we had a lot of submitters they were excited mm. to get you um is from katie is here 92 she asks one official question okay and then she had a follow-up that we okay. talked we alluded to earlier okay so katie is here 92 has said and, and you spoke about it a little bit about when you became a naf chief mm -hmm. command chief um, but maybe you have another example from earlier in your career is what has been the most significant leadership challenge you faced and how did you deal with it? Um, the most significant leadership challenge I have had is being completely working on my self-awareness right now. I know some folks tend to focus on outside, right? External things. Um, that to me is not the most important. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is um, for me is really knowing who I am, what my values are, what I stand for, um, what I'm bringing into this world, what I want to bring into this world, um, and then having the courage to do that, right? To, to, to be bold and step into who I am fully, right? So that does go back to what I was talking about earlier. Um, to, and, and I can give, like, I, I gave some more serious examples to, um, like, one of the things that, and you and I've talked about it some, uh, my time, right? I'm very, very deliberate with my time, and I've become more and more deliberate with it um, as I've progressed in my career. And this is a leadership thing, right? This all goes back to what I'm talking about. Um, what the things that I value and I prioritize, I want to be able to give my family 
my myself, right? And not just kind of a worn out, exhausted, you know, I'm physically there, but not there, right? Mm -hmm. Like being fully present with my family, um, spending time on developing myself as a, as a person, as a human being. Um, all of us to say, like, I'm trying to give you this small example. I am not active on social media. That is a conscious decision that I made because when I looked at all the different, um, things that are very important to me for my time. And then all the demands on my time. One of the things that I decided to not give time to at this point in my life is social media. I, um, I am not in any way saying that it is a bad thing. I, mm -hmm. I, I think it can be very effective means of communication, but for me to engage in social media, it is something I would have to do in my off duty time. I have very few precious waking hours for myself and my family. So that is something, um, I've chosen not to engage in. I do sometimes think about, right, this is part of that challenge, right, C constantly reflecting on who I am, what my values are, what my priorities are, and the impact that I'm having. Um, I do sometimes think about what opportunities I may be missing, mm -hmm. um, but then I have to think about how does that weigh against what opportunities would I miss if I did that instead of something else, right? Mm -hmm. I'd have to, something else would have to give. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the types of things that have been leadership challenges for me. It's, it's more what's internal, right? Mm -hmm. Being fully conscious of who I am and who I want to show up as in the world. Yeah. And Good. Katie, yep. Katie asks if you have, and, and I know, um, unfortunately neither chief right nor I ever get this question. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, Katie also would like to know if you have time to answer this one. As a non-Air Force question, she says, um, what hair products do you use? And as <laughs> she says, your hair looks amazing. And all we put up was your bio photo. Yeah, that's uh, that's sweet. So here's, um, I got a couple of fun stories for you. Yeah. Uh, like I, said, I brought up earlier, the two most frequently asked questions I get personally are, of course, related to being a woman. And the second is about my hair, uh, which is, Really related, interesting. Yeah. Um, so first I will say uh, on just a practical note, but I do want to unpack that a little bit too, uh, is that um, the the most important thing to healthy hair is your nutrition. Eat healthy foods. I eat a lot of plant-based diet. Um, make sure you eat in the colors of the rainbow, drink lots of water. I use sulfate-free hair products. Um, I don't stress out my hair. I have no chemicals in my hair. Mm -hmm. I don't dye my hair, even though I reserve the right to within standards. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it's funny though, because I do get the questions a lot about my hair. So I want to talk about that for a second. Uh, I want to talk about gold, right? So have you ever heard the phrase, uh, all that glitters is not gold. Right. Right. So I've noticed, um, one of the things that I want to challenge airmen to, to just explore and reflect on is where does your attention go? Right. Um, are you spending your time, those precious seconds, um, on things that are really valuable, important to you? Or are you distracted by things that glitter, right? So uh, I started thinking about this. Why do we say um, all that glitters is not gold? Why is, why is gold? Why is gold so important, right? It's just a yellow rock. So I started, I did some research. Like, why is gold such a big deal, mm -hmm. right? The crux of it, gold was chosen as kind of our standard for what is valuable, right? How we determine worth because uh, one, it's rare that it's not common, right? It's not, it's not something you can just find anywhere, but it's not so rare that it's impossible to find. Mm -hmm. um, it is malleable, right? You can shape gold into any kind of shape. Mm -hmm. um, you can take an ounce of gold and stretch it over countless miles, right? They make gold wires for, I don't know, electro magnetic, whatever, right? So they use it for all kinds of communication. Um, it isn't brittle, right? It doesn't break. Mm -hmm. It is soft. Um, and it is non-reactive. So um, it doesn't, you put different chemicals with it, it stays gold, it doesn't have a chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, things like fool's gold, pyrite, right? You've ever seen that? It's kind of glittery. It looks very, very close. Oh, the other thing about gold is it's ductile. It conducts electricity. That was the other part I wanted, right? So it moves energy. Mm. So um, pyrite um, is very brittle, right? It breaks very easily. Um, 
it's very common. It's all over the place. Uh, you can find it anywhere, right? Um, it is um, non-ductile. It doesn't kind of. It doesn't conduct energy in any way. It's very reactive. It reacts with all kinds of things. The chemical properties of it will change. So just keep that in your mind and go on a journey with me for a second. You know about the gold rush. You heard about the gold. Like people would go looking for gold. So they were all the time fooled by this fool's gold, right? Mm -hmm. They would go out into the riverbeds like the old time. And they would sift right? Mud, right? And things. And they'd see something sparkle and they'd be all excited for a second. I've hit gold. Ah, oh, no, I was pyrite. So how they actually found the real gold, right? Is they would have to find these little nuggets. They had to, like, they would test for the, the brittleness of it and the corrosiveness of it. So when they would find those little nuggets of real gold, then they would follow it upstream, right? They'd keep looking for those little nuggets until it stopped and then they would go back a little bit and they would dig deep, right? Cause that's where the, the vein of gold would mm. be. Like that's where the real gold was. Mm. So in life, I'm gonna share with you, you're gonna have all kinds of things that are gonna capture your attention, right? They glitter. They're not gonna move energy, mm -hmm. right? They're brittle. They will not stand the test of time. They're, they do not last, right? They're very reactive. They'll change with whatever's going on around it. The things that are really valuable are harder to find. They take time and they take effort and you're going to have to put some sweat into it mm -hmm. and you're going to have to dig deep and it's worth it because those are the things that are really going to shape something that is valuable and lasting and will last for your lifetime and way beyond you and your legacy. Yeah. So I am happy to talk about my hair products. <laughs> What I would say though is, is that really the most valuable thing? Right. And I'm not at all critiquing the person that asked me that question. Or the person that selected it. Or the person I, that I selected it. That too. Because, yeah. you know, it's fun. Um, but what I would say is, you know, just in general, like notice throughout your day, I just take 24 hours to notice how many things, sparkly things that have no value and will not last, mm -hmm. capture your time and attention and focus and energy. Yeah. versus the things that matter the most. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good. Googity moody. Yeah, that was great. Thank Thanks. you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. And um, so hydrate, eat right, and focus on what's important. Yeah. yeah. Sulfate-free products. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chief, for those answers. Um, as always, everyone out there, if you want to reach us, you can reach us on Twitter at SimSaf18. Um, we're also Facebook and Reddit. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chief Wright. All right. Hey, well, thanks, thanks again to all the, the listeners out there who submitted questions. Hey, Summer, what do you do for fun? So uh, I do a lot of yoga. Um, I am actually in yoga teacher training right now, okay. working on um, my 200-hour yoga teacher uh, training certification. Wow. Um, the power of online courses, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I... Um, I, do, I love making things and learning how to do things. So I've uh, been crocheting a lot, right? So uh, I've made a lot of baby blankets. We had a big baby boom in the 16th Air Force, so yeah. a lot of baby blankets. Uh, I crochet shawls. That's a great thing to do on airplanes because um, it doesn't take up a lot of space. It's easy to transport, and it keeps my hands busy, and I can listen to podcasts and audiobooks and those types of things. Yeah. Um, I love being outdoors. Um, having spent most of my adult life in rooms without windows, um, anytime I can get outside in the fresh air and the sunshine and see the grass and right and get my feet on the earth, right? Like it feels really good. So, um, hiking, um, we do a lot of stand up paddle boarding. Mm -hmm. Um, my husband and I, um, uh, going out on the water, um, I also love to watch Netflix, right? I love, uh, I love uh, superhero movies, right? Yeah. Fantasy, science fiction. Um, I do a lot of that. I read a lot. Yeah. Um, and then I, to go back to, the, we were talking about the strength, I'm always trying to learn something, right? Mm -hmm. So right now it's, I'm working on the yoga teacher training. And then when I finish that, it'll be something else. That is yeah. That is fun for me. Yeah. I really enjoy the process of learning new things. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. That's that's I'm, I'm the exact same way. So speaking of uh, mm -hmm. baby boom and baby blankets, I want to mm -hmm. give a shout out to one of your teammates, CMS Sergeant Paige Flaherty, yes. uh, who is I think went into labor a little bit earlier today. So best of luck to her. Thank uh, you. And uh, and the baby. Uh, you also talked about being a uh, learner. And mm -hmm. uh, so what do you what are you listening to or reading right now outside of the the yoga? 
Exactly. Yoga stuff. Or what's the, uh, what, what would be one book you would recommend to our audience, book or podcast? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna double up on that, okay. right? So one of the books I just picked up and started reading, and so far I'm enjoying. I think it's it would be um, helpful for Airmen to take a look at is um, Talking to Strangers: mm. What We Should Know About the People We Don't Know by mm. Malcolm Gladwell. I love it, right? Because yeah. again, that that goes back to everybody has a story and bring in our connection together. Um, as far as it, like the one book I recommend everybody read. Um, the most impactful book I think for me in my life uh, is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, yeah. Um, yes. And they should listen to Talking to Strangers. I don't know if you listen to I it. haven't yet, but I do know that when he made when he wrote that book, he made it for as to be an audio book and he wrote, yeah. he's interviewed people. So that's one of the things I need to do is go get yeah. the audio book. The, the audio book is so good because okay. he actually uses footage, um, oh, okay. tape from a lot of the stuff that he talks about. There's actual actual tapes. Well, so, thanks. Yeah. It's a good recommendation. I have read that, that it's worth getting the audio book. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, lots of people will be disappointed to hear, um, just like I was. Um, I think I was equally disappointed and happy that you're retiring. Mm. Um, we, you, you are always in the conversation of something bigger and better and greater, and she could be the chief master of the Air Force someday, and you know, so on and so forth. But you've elected to retire mm -hmm. and to be able to spend more time with your family. So what's next? What are you gonna do? So um, we have a home in North Georgia. Um, okay. It's the foothills of the Appalachia. It's a beautiful area. Mm -hmm. um, there are rivers and lakes and um, lots of hiking trails. The Appalachia Trail goes through there. Um, it's right towards the end of the trail. Mm -hmm. um, there's breweries and vineyards and art galleries, and it's just a piece of heaven on earth, right? Yeah. It is amazing. And the people are warm and welcoming. Um, my, I will always be of service to others. That's just who I am. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it is part of my sacred purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I am, as I think of this next transition for me, I, Part of it will be teaching yoga. I also want to focus on mindfulness. It's overall wellness for, for people so that they can find a place within themselves that they can step into their lives as a whole complete person, recognizing that they were never broken in the first place, yeah. right? Uh, I do want to focus also on people that are survivors of trauma, whether they are visible or invisible wounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I really want to put deep roots down in a community. Uh, Brene Brown, who is is one of my just tremendous inspiration for mm -hmm. me. Um, I recently listened to a podcast she did. Tim Ferriss was mm -hmm. um, interviewing her. So you're like these two great people together. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she said something with me. I'm like, this so beautifully articulates what I have been struggling to articulate to others. She said uh, when she younger in her life and earlier years, her motto was further, faster, further, faster. I got to go further, faster, you know, drive, drive, drive. Um, she's finding now, she's like, I want to have slower, closer, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it has been, I had to get emotional thinking about it. It's been such a beautiful journey that I have had as an airman. Yeah. And who I am now, the, the Air Force really allowed me to, to step fully into that. And I will always be grateful. And as I focus on what's most important to me right now, I feel like I can best serve that and, mm -hmm. and the people around me by doing that slower, closer approach, right? Yeah. And so um, this will always be my family. It mm -hmm. will always be part of who I am. Um, and we have amazing, incredible airmen and chiefs, right, mm -hmm. that are um, going to step up into these positions and do so much more than I could have ever done. Yeah. I think what's uh, so powerful about it is um, something that I encourage people to do all the time, whether it's in or out of the military, is find your purpose and live mm -hmm. it, right? And it sounds like that's what you'll be doing. So I'm happy for you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, again, I was a little, a little down when I, when I found out you were retiring, but uh, it pretty quickly, you know, I realized um, that, you know, you're, you're living your purpose, you're doing the right thing by yourself and your family. So on behalf of all airmen, um, across our United States Air Force. 
I want to say thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your inspiration, your encouragement, your wisdom. I mean, it, it has been something amazing to watch, and we all appreciate you. So, Thank you. It's been um, my honor. All right. So I know uh, you're the big woman on campus. You got a lot of things that you need to get back to. And uh, so we're going to wrap up here. And again, I want to say thank you. Uh, let me just also take a minute uh, to thank a few people who made this possible, of course, first. Some Chief Summer Lifer, our guest for today, Command Chief for 16th Air Force. Thanks to all the people who submitted questions and a special thanks uh, to the team who makes this happen. Our ground producer, Mr. Manny Garcia, and the excellent team that's here at 16th Air Force. Our production team back at home in DC, Juan, Cat, Tony, and the head detective, uh, CMAS Sergeant Harry Kibbe. Uh, and lastly, thank you to all of our listeners um, who are out there on the front lines taking care, of, taking care of your airmen and leading teams. This has been your Blueprint Leadership Podcast. I am Kay Wright, your Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. And remember, if better is possible, good is never enough, and you are your greatest competition.